Okay, so thanks for having me here. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about like a um, like little project that um, I did with a couple of people. Um, and I, I'd like to start with uh, the quote from uh, Yuval Harari. Um, let's see if that shows up right. Um, so basically, he, he said, like, I'm sort of paraphrasing him a bit now, but um, AI has hacked the OS of humans language. So I think if you combine that with a quote from Schneier saying, uh, amateur hackers uh, hack systems, real hackers hack people, and then if the OS of people is language, then we're, we're in an interesting state right now, right? We're just in the beginning development of how um, large language models are, are influencing us. So maybe briefly about myself. Um, I'm self-employed. I work uh, at uh, EC Digit CSERC with uh, David, Klaus, and a couple of other people. I've been working at CERDT at the National CERD of Austria for many years. It was a great time. Uh, but this work is, uh, you know, a contribution and a collaboration of many people. Um, so I get to stand here, but quite a few people contributed. So Ale shout out to Alex, uh, to Jürgen Brandl from the Interior Ministry of Austria, um, the AI um, SIG at first. That's a good place to actually learn more about the topics. Um, and also thanks to, to Robert uh, from Orkley and David and Benoit who supported me. Right. Uh, all errors are mine to keep. I'm not speaking for uh, digit. Um, and what am I going to talk about? First, like, why, why, what's the motivation for, for using LLMs in CTI? Um, and very, very short recap, how does it work? But I don't want to bore you with that because I think we've seen that many times already. Uh, I want to get to the juicy things. Um, and that will be basically training, fine tuning, uh, your own data set, uh, on your own data set, um, with local models. And then we end up with uh, integration into MISP. Okay, so what do we want to achieve? Um, essentially, LLMs are great for understanding, in double quotes, unstructured reports, text, like human-generated text. Um, and we can use them actually to extract uh, structured information out of it. Uh, which goes far beyond what regular expressions or other systems can do. Uh, it's pretty amazing what they can do, actually. Um, so use cases that where it w works, summarization works. Uh, summarization of CTI reports just works. This is pretty amazing. Um, using RAG, uh, retrieval augmented generation on freeform text um, is okay. It, it's not too bad. There, it, there are some mistakes with RAG, but it sort of is okay. Named entity recognition, I usually compare it to like taking your yellow marker and marking the keywords that you have in text. Um, it's also pretty solid um, right now. Uh, it becomes interesting when you go to the next use cases, which are really, I think, relevant for CTI. Uh, mapping T codes, uh, so understanding like text and saying this is T10057 uh, because I understood what the meaning was behind that. And then if you are able to do that step, basically you can extract a knowledge graph and do sticks. And um, yeah, basically that, that's the end goal for me <laughs> to actually have like a sticks uh, output from unstructured text. Valid, correct one. Um, so very quick recap, just for those who didn't encounter this yet. Uh, how does an LLM actually work? It predicts the next token slash word um, and feeds it back into the input. Um, and then it predicts the next one based on that. So you can imagine it like a big Markov chain kind of thing. Um, and of course, it only gives you probabilities for the next prediction based on the training data. That is the key thing here, right? So if you have like the sentence, start token, not all here is where, what's the next most probable one? Capes. Um, it's a guess. It will put it back in and then predict the next word uh, based on that. But in a sense, this is simple. It's like not magic. I always like to say that LMs are not magic. We can understand them. We can train them. Like You don't have to be open AI to actually do it. Um, but it is in a sense magic <laughs> because just that, you know, like, like I said in the beginning, it, it hacked the OS of humans, right? We seem to think, that's why I'm so fascinated by this topic, we seem, seem to think with language in a similar way, right? If I'm going to say the sentence, what comes 
Next, you probably had it in your mind, right? Or some similar word. So this is actually very similar to what happens here. Um, so this is really fascinating. That's, that's why I'm so fascinated by it, because it can, can give us so many things. But there are obstacles. Um, especially in our field, in, in, in um, sensitive fields, we do have a problem. Um, if we send everything to chat GPT, uh, then, well, we're revealing a lot. And here's a really good article by The Atlantic, which I recommend that uh, you take a look at, because it goes in way more detail of uh, all the problems. And I think it's actually now we're at the time when we experimented a lot to take a step back and actually look at this problem again and say, like, okay, what are we actually revealing by sending data via the API, via the web chat interface? Are we revealing too much? Um, what, what are we actually revealing? Uh, so if I code, if I use uh, Copilot, um, I basically, <laughs> I'm leaking the corporate code. Unless it's open source and it's fine and it was open source anyway, right? Um, I'm also revealing like metadata. I'm all re revealing lots of things about how I think as a coder. How I might be judged in the future for employment or whatever, you know. But it's, it goes way beyond that. Uh, this article in the Atlantic was really good. Uh, if you take a look at the hour-long personal conversations that OpenAI got, you find really juicy things, like advice for relationship, breakups, how to get her back, um, illnesses, mental health discussions, um, deeper sexual desires, girlfriend, boyfriend replacement, uh, etc. So this is really so juicy. My point is, this is so juicy for advertisement that it, it will be extremely hard to ignore. So what my prediction, and I'm sort of being a little bit cocky about this now, but I think my prediction is like in the next few years or next year, we'll see that advertisement will have to jump on this data. And this, uh, Cory Doctorov gave it a good name. He called it uh, officially and shitification. <laughs> so it goes in three stages. First, the, the companies are really nice to users. You have like, you know, if you take a look at the costs of OpenAI, like they have run high costs currently and their income from paying customers isn't even covering that, um, apparently. Uh, so right now they're good to use us, right? But this industry, like many industries in, in Silicon Valley, or many internet, um, in, uh, like companies from the internet, internet startup companies, thanks, um, have to go through these stages, like good for the users, then good for the business, and then good to themselves. <laughs> um, so... My answer to that is, we can do it, we know how to do it, we have the brains, especially in Europe, we need local models. Um, but can we do it as good as you know the others? And the answer is, well, sort of. It depends. It depends on your use case. Um, but let's first look at how do we actually train a model, right? Um, there, are, there are different types of training. There's pre-training, there's continuous pre-training. For those, you, you need supercomputers, right? But for reinforcement learning, human feedback, fine-tuning, especially fine-tuning, you can do it yourself. And if you, if you restrict your use case to something which is uh, amendable to um, using LLMs for it, and you don't have to have this huge general, wor huge general world knowledge um, LLM, then you're actually in, in luck. Uh, you can fine-tune it. How does fine-tuning work? Very briefly, um, you use a foundational model like Lama, Lama 3, Mixtral, Mistral, um, and you have that, that, that um, blue box on the, on the uh, left here. Um, basically, you have this big pre-trained weight, weights from the base model. You can imagine it like a big matrix. So the input vector that you saw in the beginning comes in, and the job is basically to predict the next token, next word, um, and that would be sort of the path can you actually see the cursor here? No, you can't. Path to the top H, to that vector, output vector H. Um, now what you can do is basically, these X and H are numbers, right? The, their, their representation, the in latent space, embedding space, um, the representation of the input and output strings. Um, what you can do is you can nudge the vector, the floating point vectors, the H on the top, into a slightly different direction by basically adding and subtracting vectors, right? Like we did in, in, in linear algebra in university. 
So, or school, whatever. It's like, um, basically, it, this is simple. So there, there, there are ways to do that by just simply calculating smaller matrices, like the A and the B here on the right side, and um, making them so, so that it nudges the output vector H into the right direction that you want it to have. Now, the good news is these smaller matrices, the orange ones, are computable on consumer-grade hardware. Um, so if you have a nice GPU, um, like at home from gaming, or even an older one, you can do it. The flip side is you probably don't get to do it on the larger base models, like the 22 billion, etc. You can do it on the smaller ones, but you can experiment with that at home. Um, so that is the trick. Basically, if I want to nudge the output text, the generated output text, towards what usually gets generated for my domain knowledge, CTI texts, CTI reports, medical, whatever you have, we can do that. So, but, now comes the but. So the training is easy, in a sense. The but is the data set and the benchmarking. So what testing is for classical computer sciences, benchmarking is for LLMs AI. And that turns out to be much harder. <laughs> so, um, which data sets do we have for benchmarking? We have uh, one by Bosch with 400 CTI reports. We have one from Mitra Tram, and then we have Oracle EU, um, which is a big one. I'll talk about it in a minute, and a couple of others. And then, of course, we have MISP. Uh, we're here in Luxembourg. We have MISP, yeah. <laughs> and MISP is uh, also great for for adding like the specific words and terminology and the uh, the keywords, yeah. So. So, okay, so oracle.eu, um, O-R-K-L, not, not the database company, is a collection, big collection by Robert Heist um, of 13,000 and something CTI reports which were public on the internet. He just basically collected it. And he made a nice search interface to, for that. He extracted the alias of synonyms of uh, threat actors. Um, you can search by campaigns, threat actors, and so on. It's really good. And you can download the whole thing. This is extremely good for me. Um, however, also that has some problems. Um, first of all, the data is messy and it's hard to train on. If you take the text, con converted text, and he used some Java PDF to text conversion, that got messed up somehow. So um, if you go back to the PDFs, Getting the stuff out from PDFs is a hard problem because it's a, it's a visual format. And, um, there might be, you know, relevant text in text boxes or in PNGs which are embedded in the, in the PDF. So, unfortunately, this is, this is where it gets slow, right? You start like, oh, we can train, we can do stuff, we can do it our own. Actually, doing that is easy. And then you come to the point, oh, creating a data set and split off something of the data set and keep it for benchmarking, that is much harder. Um, so, Jürgen, me, uh, we created uh, something called uh, CTI Tools. It's an AI workbench. Um, basically, uh, the idea is, um, yeah, I think I'll just show it to you. It's the easiest. The idea is that, um, let's see if that works. Can you see the screen? No, you still see the other one. Okay, hang on. Do you see this now? Yes. So um, it's a, gamify, a gamified uh, approach to actually labeling and uh, rating uh, summaries for CTI reports. Um, so basically here you can get, get a random report from Oracle EU. Uh, I'll, I'll ask an LLM to summarize it. And then I will ask you to rate that summary here. Relevance, faithfulness, fluency, coherence, coverage, etc. And you can give it a score, and that score gives me the instruction fine-tuning data set that I need for saying, like, you know, this is a good summary, and this is a bad summary. And with that, I can do quite a few tricks, uh, fine-tuning, reinforcement learning for um, for a new data uh, training, uh, local uh, local model and a training data set, yeah? So another thing is like, you can already use that for named entity recognition and summarization for yourself, right? If I do a named entity recognition, the marking, the colored marking of what is important, 
Here you have different categories. I don't know if you can see that from the back. Let me make it bigger. You, you have like things where you say, okay, well, this is an organization. Let's click on organization. Microsoft is an organization. I'll just click on it. I labeled it now. So it was like click, click. Yeah. Very, very fast. So the idea was all the labeling tools, the annotation tools that we saw were really not very fast and not very elegant and not, not suitable for actually labeling it. So once we label it, you get to get the training data set. You can just download it, right? Um, so this is a gamified approach to create, collaboratively create a good benchmark and training data set because this problem is hard. This is not so, it doesn't scale so easily. We tried, um, we tried also like using an LM to simulate a human to rate a summary. And that doesn't work so well. I was initially enthusiastic, but it didn't work so well, actually. So we, I think we still need the humans. Yeah? It can be a help, but yeah. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Good. Yes. Um, so you see, we're, we're now in a, in a, in a, uh, loop in a positive uh, loop um, upward spiral uh, uh, where basically we have um, uh, an AI backend uh, we use that uh, we we have human feedback on the output of it we create a new data set with that data set we can train uh, models step four and then basically share that and then again improve it and use it for the first AI backend step number one uh, judgment. So the more we do it, the better we get. It's a positive feedback loop here. So that's where I need you. Please do take your phone and do it. <laughs> oh, I can also the link, the slides, you'll have the links uh, at the end. But basically, there's an invite code here um, for accessing that. And you get the benefits in CTI tools of actually using the summarization the CTI specific summarization and the um, named entity recognition, more use cases coming. Um, so you get to use it. You can actually use it in your, in your work, but please also do label and rate a bit. It takes you like, if you look at it, it takes you like maybe 30 seconds. And if we have, an, you know, if everyone in the room does the one, we have the data set. So far, lessons learned. We presented that at first, and actually we thought it would be, we, we get much more. We didn't get that much, actually, in the sense of data set. We don't have enough data yet. It's, it, it will be good enough for benchmarking, but it will not be good enough for training. So that was a little bit of a setback. So for a training data set, we need more. Um, the solution is, um, and I think this is a little bit debatable, actually, to use GPT-4 or Mini, which is dirt cheap, especially in batch mode. And we cleaned up 10,000 Oracle EU reports, first Pi PDF, then GPT-4 O Mini, to clean it up and make markdown out of it. Cost me 38 US dollars. And we can fine tune on that. And that's what we did. Um, Laura fine tuning on the, this data set um, was done on the base model, on the Mistral AI base model, for now for testing the 7B model. Um, and here is actually the link, and I think this link is very relevant because that link, if you just follow the instructions from that link, um, you get a really easy how to to train on Mistral. Um, and yeah, I will need more GPU power to train on the Mistral model because that's quite large. That's 100, essentially 178 billion floating point numbers. I only have only have three RTX 4090 at home. And the training of that took me, I think, five hours. So that was absolutely doable. Now, important question, why Mistral? Why did I choose Mistral here? Because I did another test um, for a benchmark for machine translation. Luckily, data sets exist for that. Uh, there's a well-known Comet score and a Flores data set for translating languages. So people took lang input language, output language, and um, basically you can uh, then compare the translation of the LLM towards the should be, the humanly generated should be. And if you take a look at this graph, I don't know if you can see it here on the, um, uh, the, the model, the, the top notch models are, well, our systems are DeepL and OpenAI GPT-4O. 
Um, I think it was 4.0 directly. No, it was 4.0 mini, sorry. Um, and these are the top ones, the blue one and the, uh, which one is it? The purple one here. So these are the top ones, except for some languages. Croatian, for example, really sucks for a TPL. Um, and then if you take a look at the brown one, the last one here, uh, always on the, on the right, for, well, German is not that good, but otherwise it's pretty good. The mixed roll eight times, sorry, the red one, I was bad. The mixed roll eight times 22 billion is really getting close. And that is good news because like if we train on that, we have a really solid model which understands a lot of language. Now, how do we train it? I promised you like um, I'm going to show you the, the training part here. Uh, the, there Again, there are two types of training, the raw or pre-training, which I did. Uh, I just took the texts from Oracle U, the nice ones, the cleaned up ones, lots of work of cleanup. Um, uh, and then basically put it into a JSON uh, list, uh, JSON L file with text, and then text contained in the document number one, text contained in the document two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Just put it in. The instruction fine tuning is slightly different. The instruction fine tuning looks like uh, is is it's like the, the the format more or less that you send to OpenAI. So you have messages with the roles. The user is the user input, and the assistant is basically the LLM. And so you give it like question, answer, as examples, so that it can train on that. And there is where the summarization part comes in that I mentioned before in CTI tools. If I have like the good summaries, I have the question, summarize this text, here's the answer, summary, and you rated it. You helped me to, say, to choose which ones are the good ones. So the dirty little secret of AI, there's no I in AI, and secondly, it's humans. <laughs> All right, so uh, how do we actually train that then? Um, uh, so that, that training is the easy part, right? We have like, it's well documented here. It's like Torch Run. In this case, there are eight GPUs in this example. Um, you train in, in, the, in the config file. The config file is not too long. It's easy to understand. It's well documented. And you get a training run. And the training run looks usually something like that. If it's a good run, it should look like that, roughly. You have like a high loss, and it goes down towards one. And uh, then you test it and profit. So, where I'm standing, how much, how, mu how am I looking on time, actually? I have no clue. Good, five minutes, good, okay. Um, status quo is, it works very well with Mistral 7B for me. I would like to scale up to the larger models, 70 billion or eight times 22 billions, but I need GPUs for that. If someone of you sits on too many GPUs, please come to and talk to me afterwards. <laughs> um, and then uh, the next thing is like uh, evaluation against the CTI tools benchmark. And finally, that is something that we did for first already. And I think Sami, mentioned to me before the, the, the talk that there is some really good news coming that MISP has better support for integration of local models. So the way this would work is basically serve the local model with a RESTful API. Um, and uh, yeah, here's the diagram, that's easier. Here's the RESTful API on the left side. The, uh, it serves the AI LLM part. In, in this case, we can do GPT-4, or you can do your own lo local models. And MISP here on the right side, um, uh, well, you give it a URL of a report. It will fetch the report and basically go to the RESTful API server, get all the information out, and add it to the MISP event. And then the human has to review, because of hallucinations, sometimes an LLM has hallucinations. And it will look like this, basically the tags. Sorry, I think that was, yeah, here. Uh, it will add the tags and the right information. You can also add basically attributes, whatever you, you need. Um, and um, voila. So call for action. Um, all the stuff that I did with Jürgen, Alex, and the great folks is basically on Hugging Face and on GitHub. So all the models, tools, for training uh, is there for reproducible 
you know, reproducibility. Re re <laughs> so that I get the word out. <laughs> okay. Um, but I need also your help. Um, that's this really call for action. I think we as a community, we can do it. We should do it. We should not be dependent on uh, sending all, all our data, especially CTI data, to, to the cloud somewhere. I think that is um, maybe in some cases okay, but in other cases not. Voila. That's, yeah, my contact info. I think I'm finished. Thank you. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has a question. <laughs> Come on, you're awake now. This is the second talk. No? Uh, yeah, we do have one. Oh. Thank you, thank you for the talk. Is the AI workbench uh, source code available so we can uh, use it on a private data set or is not yet available? Uh, I have to ask Jürgen, I think, I think he, he plans to actually put it up. I think we did not yet, but I'll ask him. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we focused for the CTI tools workbench. We focused actually on, on, on the data. It was not so, the, the code was sort of a, just a means. But if you're interested in the code, that's good feedback. Yeah. The, the big problem that we had was good data set. Yeah. We have another question. Uh, Klaus? No, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, there are also like crowdsourcing solutions uh, for collecting data, um, mm -hmm. like um, Amazon Turk and others that mm -hmm. could be very cheap. Okay. Uh, especially if you're looking for people who can just pinpoint organizations, not very technical part of it. Mm -hmm. So just a suggestion, uh, because I think data over here is really, really important. I will do my part of as much as I can, but I think uh, that's also a solution which I've used in the past and really helped me. Okay, that's that's good feedback. I'll, I'll come to you afterwards and learn. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah I just wanted to uh, reply to your answer uh, because some of organ some organization might be able to provide you feedback on the tool or provide some of the resulting data set but not the training data. In okay, interesting, yeah. Okay, cool. Also good. All right. Uh, I also hear that some of the uh, LLM output detection tools can detect hallucinations. So if you're interested more, I, I have a contact you can talk to. He's yes. here in the room. Yes. Thank anyway, you. so I think we're out of time. Thank you, Aaron, for the presentation. Thank you.